Welcome back to the All About Audiology podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lilach Saperstein, and today we're going to be talking about auditory processing disorder, APD, sometimes also called central auditory processing disorder or CAPD. And we're also going to be touching on the idea of sound sensitivities and when you get that feeling that there are nails on the chalkboard or pen clicking that's driving you crazy. Um, Some of us have those experiences and in fact, some people have those kind of sound sensitivities where they can become really debilitating. So I brought in an expert, Dr. Melissa Karp, to talk to us about uh, some of these how to test for these things and how we can help our children and our patients that are struggling with auditory processing disorder or sound sensitivities. And before we jump into that interview, I do want to remind you that you can come over to allaboutaudiology.com to hear all the previous episodes or read full transcripts. And in addition, you can join the email list. The email list is where I send you stories and updates behind the scenes, and it's really fun. I send you uh, emails and you guys respond back, and it's kind of uh, super fun to have little pen pals around the world uh, who are interested in these topics, who are engaging with the, the conversations that we're having here on the podcast. So I would love for you to join. And if you are interested, you can also get some free resources, free downloadables that are on the website. The first is the five-step guide to navigating your child's hearing loss. And this is a beautiful guide which lays out what is the journey ahead whenever you had first gotten the diagnosis or even if you've gotten the diagnosis years ago, there are still questions that you need to address and make sure you have the support in place. So that guide is a downloadable PDF with fillable spaces but also can be printed out and it can really follow you along with the journey. I know there are many audiologists who share this with their patients and it is available for free on the website at allaboutaudiology.com slash guide. There's also a hearing aid checklist on there and that's perfect for establishing morning and evening routines around the hearing aids. This is really helpful to have at home but it's also great to give the teacher or give someone who is also helping with the care of the child, babysitter, nanny, grandparents, whoever else is involved with the care, um, to have an organized list where you have all the different things that need to be taken care of when there are hearing aids. Um, And in general, dealing with devices is something that, you know, takes time. There's an orientation. You have to learn what all the parts are and how they work together and what happens when they break. Um, So those two resources are free over at allaboutaudiology.com and that way you can join the email list and we can stay in touch. So let's go right ahead and jump into this episode. Thank you for listening and I look forward to hearing what you think about this on Instagram, on Facebook, and on the website. Welcome Dr. Melissa Karp. Thank you so much for joining us from North Carolina. Um, Today we're going to be talking about sound sensitivity and auditory processing in children. And I'm really glad that you're on the the, um, show with us because this is a topic that we get a lot of requests about. So thank you so much for joining and tell us uh, a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm so glad to be here. Um, I think what's really interesting is you say you get a lot of requests for it. Auditory processing and sound sensitivity are some of those disorders that they're not rare, they're rarely known. So a lot of people will have issues with auditory processing that may be maybe a little subclinical or they learned how to compensate for it. And almost anyone you ask has some type of sound sensitivity, whether it's to, you know, maybe a specific sound or the way certain people chew, but it's not really affecting their life. So they haven't sought treatment for it. Whereas in other people, it becomes very, very disruptive. So you know, a lot of times when I see children and we diagnose, the parents are like, oh my gosh, this is, this is me. I have the exact same thing. It's just not as bad. So, you know, the good take home is that there are a lot of people with these things going on. It's a spectrum of sorts and that they're not alone. Wow. I can definitely see that if someone has it just a little bit, then they'll, they'll say, yeah, I mean, the, the truck nails on the chalkboard, 
and like pen clicking. Those are like common things you hear people be annoyed about, but what would it, what would it look like when it's someone who's really, it's disrupting their life? So for someone who it, it truly disrupts their life, we have to keep in mind for sound sensitivity, it truly releases these emotions of fear, disgust, anger, resentment, rage, and it's not under this person's control. They've created this emotional connection. It's this conditioned response when they hear these sounds. So it may mean that they avoid eating with their family and they want to eat in their room. It may mean that they don't go out with certain friends or they avoid different situations or in the classroom, they can't concentrate without putting in their earbuds and drowning out the sound. It, it can truly impact relationships. Yeah. And it seems like what the pathways that are happening there is that it like crosses over into the limbic system, the emotions. So how, how much do we know about that? Not as much as we'd like to. We do you know it, it does tend to be this you know conditioned reflex arc so you have the stimuli or the trigger sound and it can be auditory but for some people it, it transfers and becomes a visual trigger as well so if you tend to be very bothered by chewing sounds then the next thing you might become very bothered by or triggered by is someone's jaw moving a certain way because your system, it's its trying to protect you. It's trying to keep you safe. It doesn't realize this isn't a threat. And their system is going crazy saying, oh my gosh, it's going to make that sound. It's going to make that sound. And then I'm going to feel bad. So you, know, you have to kind of keep that in, in mind as well. But the other thing we know with that conditioned reflex arc is that it's not just that stimuli, that trigger sound but there tends to be a physical reaction as well. We tend to see a muscle contraction of some type. So it might be a tightening of the jaw, pulling of the shoulders, intake of breath. There's some other, for in about 90% of people, some other type of response that gets tied into this reflex arc. So while some of our treatment is looking at reducing the, um, I guess, the intensity of the sound and creating a positive experience with other sounds. Some of our treatment actually looks at reducing that physical response and breaking that reflex arc in another way. So there's, it's multi-pronged. Yeah. It's like an aversion. That's just like a, a gut reaction, a body reaction. Yes. Okay. And so how do you diagnose these kinds of um, sound sensitivities? What, is there another term for it also? Like misophonia comes into it or is it different? There's a lot of different types of sound sensitivity. So there's hyperacusis, which is a generalized sensitivity to all of the sounds around you, even at, at a normal level. There's misophonia, where you have that emotional reaction to very specific sounds usually made by specific people. That's the one that we I tend to see the most of. Uh, there's phonophobia, which is fear of sound. What else is there? Those are really the main main ones that I'm thinking of off the top of my head. I think we learned about diplocusis back in the day, where if they hear mm -hmm. one tone, like one tone is played, a person will hear two tones. And that some musicians have this, where they play one key on the piano, but they are perceiving two different notes. Yeah, that's a little different than sound sensitivity. Right. But very cool. Okay. That is like one of those super rare things. And I was like, no one has that. And then I asked my cousin who was a musician and he was like, I have that. And it's crazy for like one note. And he's telling me which key it is. It's really weird. <laughs> anyway, we can move along from that. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. not relevant. <laughs> There's all sorts of things that our auditory system does, which is, I guess, the point of this whole topic and why people are so interested in it is because it's not either you hear or you don't that we definitely know is not the case. And then it's also, if you have a typical hearing and you're able to hear and don't have hearing loss, that's also not the whole story. Well, exactly. It's, we hear with our ears and our brain. So the first part of any evaluation is making sure that the ears are giving a full picture to the brain. And then the next step is what is the brain doing with the sound? So that might mean central auditory processing testing. That might mean sound sensitivity testing. 
In some cases, if someone has ringing or buzzing in their ears, it might mean testing for tinnitus and trying to pitch match and loudness match for those things. So it's, it's not just do you hear the beeps. How do you test? What are the testing procedures that you do? So for sound sensitivity, it is, it's looking at does the person hear well and checking all of those frequencies. Then it's looking at what sounds are uncomfortably loud. And that's a UCL or an LDL measure where you basically, you turn up the volume until it reaches an uncomfortable loudness. For most people with misophonia, those levels are normal. It's not the tones, it's not the auditory system that's overly sensitive to regular input. It's very specific, usually person specific or sound specific triggers that bother them, but overall they don't have sound sensitivity. So that helps differentiate between misophonia and hyperacusis. And someone with a hyperacusis, those levels are gonna be very, very elevated. And when I mean elevated, very soft sounds are painfully loud. For auditory processing, it's a whole battery of tests. It's looking at what does the right hemisphere do? What does the left hemisphere do? How do they work together? How do they separate sound? And it's not just language-based tests, it's numbers and it's tones and it's temporal processing, dichotic listening, all sorts of processes that the brain uses to get information. And we try to create kind of a map of sorts to see what areas work really, really well and where are those areas of weakness that might respond well to intervention. So what are the ages that you are able to test for these kinds of things? As if they're so young, it's hard to get reliable responses, but maybe those kids are really in need of help. Sure. So for auditory processing disorder, usually by age four, there's some really good screening tests that we can use. I don't typically diagnose until age seven, but you know we don't want to wait till age seven to intervene. So if we can start seeing some areas that, you know, on really good normative data, on those normative data tests that are outside the norm, we can start working on interventions and treatments and working on those skill sets. There's no reason to wait. For children who are uh, having sound sensitivity, we usually wait a little bit. Um, you know, I would say probably the youngest I really started working with was five. But for individuals with misophonia, the peak onset of age for that disorder is about nine or 10. So we don't typically see the really, really young ones having misophonia. They might have more typical you know, central suppression issues and that are developmentally appropriate, you know, covering their ears when they come up with a fire engine or a loud sound, and then that goes away. They get very accustomed to it. So you have to be sure that it's not something that's just developmental and that it's truly in that disorder realm before you start treating. Yeah. And I think maybe a lot of parents who are listening might say, hey, my kid does uh, like doesn't like when there's loud sounds around and wants to leave the room when the, the blender is going and things like that. Like, you know, at, at what point should someone be concerned that, that there's something else going on um, versus like the typical things? Yeah. So it's, is it really a loud sound? Is it a sound that it's appropriate to be uncomfortable with? I have parents download uh, sound level meters for their phones. There's great apps that are free. NIOSH has a great app. Have you seen that some people have it on their Apple Watch? Yes. And now they're just they're just like glancing at their watch. It's too loud in here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's great. If your child's reacting to that, that's normal. I wouldn't worry about that. I know I've got a blender. It's really loud. I find that you know I don't particularly like being near it. So that's a typical issue. If you've got a child that's refusing to participate in activities or do different things and the sound isn't in that range, that's when you want to start looking at, okay, well, what, what can we start doing? How can you differentiate when it's like a behavioral thing that's, you know, it's not just sounds, it's like other things, but maybe they have that sensitivity also as a sensory um, overload, like for touching different things, like do these things overlap? Can they both can they be comorbid? Like how, how, what is your approach to that? They can, you can have a child that has, you know, multiple 
sensory processing difficulties. And that's really where you want to be careful because what are they reacting to? And a lot of times things that I'll have parents look at is when they're making noise, if the child is interested in something else, is it bothersome? That tells me, yeah, is it a behavioral issue? Have they, dis have they discovered that if they get more attention, if they cover their ears, if they tantrum, if they want to be out of the situation, are, those are the things we want to try and roll out. It's a lot of history. It's a lot of observation and talking to families. But it's also important to work with the families to try and normalize some of the responses. So if a child puts their hands over their ears and, oh, it's too loud, and it's really not too loud, you can say, oh, you know, yeah, that, that is a loud sound, but it's okay. And it, you know, show them really model the behavior that you're looking for because you're trying to normalize it. You're not trying to path make it a pathology that's not there. So in other words, you want to validate their experience of it and then try to neutralize it. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a great way of putting it. Yeah. yeah. Because I think, you know, if every time that that happens, they're then on top of it met with what's wrong with you? Know, everything's fine. It's not loud at all. Everyone else is okay. Like, whoa, <laughs> that would be very difficult, I think, to experience. I mean, and there are certain things that occupational therapists we pair with, but audiologists really do still own the auditory system. And when you have some of these sensitivities that lean more toward hyperacusis or misophonia, it is important to have an audiologist working with the occupational therapist if there are other sensory processing issues. Okay. So let's say we've got we've gotten this diagnosis where we're able to identify the specific areas that are hard for a child that are challenging for them. Then what do we do? What can we help them with? In terms of, um, the I don't know. Is it therapy? Is it sound training? Is it um, just a lot of counseling? Okay, so it's kind of hard because I know we're we're talking about two different things here, and I don't want to get yeah. the waters too muddy. So for sound sensitivity. Sometimes it is using intervention as far as wearable sound generators. We could be using different music, creating buffer sounds, things like that, desensitization protocols, and working with the parents to parent their child in a different way where they're not drawing such negative attention. So as we're working with the auditory system and we're giving it this enriched sound environment, we also want to take care that the parents are doing their part too because the child gets their information and the way they should feel about things. They get those cues from their parents. For auditory processing disorder, that's a little bit different. It might mean intervention with technology such as low gain hearing aids or FM systems. It might mean direct intervention for speech and language therapy. It might mean phonemic discrimination training with an audiologist or oral rehabilitation. Or it may mean accommodations in the classroom as far as extra time or assistance with notes or simple directions. So it, it depends. With auditory processing, it's so complicated. It's not just you have it or you don't. There are different types of auditory processing that benefit from very specific recommendations. That's why it's important to go ahead and have it tested so that you know exactly what type you're working with so that the recommendations make sense. Yeah. Would you describe some of the testing for our listeners to learn about how do we test for auditory processing disorder? Um, and what's the experience like if, if they maybe have that scheduled and coming up for their kid, how they can help prepare them for those tests? Yeah. Good night's sleep the night before. We, we always do this test first thing in the morning. Because by the end of the day, an individual with auditory processing disorder is going to be tired. It's so much, listening is so much more effortful when you have a processing disorder. So first thing in the morning, oh, like, um, good night's sleep. They're ready to go. We always talk about, do you know why you're here? And most of the kids are like, well, because I'm bad at school. No, that's not why you're here. So really making sure that they, they have an idea. We're just going to see how your brain hears. And that's often surprising to them because they don't think about their brain hearing. So we do different tests that look at how the auditory system works. 
that they don't have to participate at all for. We look at tympanograms, acoustic reflexes, OAEs. These are tests that look at the auditory reflex. It looks at some integration measures. It looks at the health of the inner ear. They have to do a hearing test. In my clinic, we do a test of attention because I want to make sure and rule out that attention deficit is not causing or contributing to a lot of the issues that the child's having. What test do you do for that? Um, I either use the ACPT, which is the Auditory Continuous Performance Test, or I use the IVAQS, which is a visual and auditory screen test that's on the computer. And I like that because it goes anywhere from five years to adult, where the ACPT only goes from six to 11. Yeah. I think that's so important to have as part of your battery so that people don't then look at the results and say, well, how do you know they weren't paying attention when they got this, this, and this incorrectly? And you say, well, exactly. this is this is how I know because I've ruled it out. <laughs> yeah. It, it is important because when I'm looking at the testing, when I'm interpreting all of the testing, I'm looking for patterns. If yeah. there's an issue on every single test, it doesn't mean that this kid has horrible auditory processing. It means that there's a global overarching issue that's preventing them from processing. Um, if they get it all wrong, patterns, global issues. If there's no pattern on the test, if everything is impacted, we know that it's not auditory processing alone. We can't necessarily say that there's not an auditory processing disorder, but we can't actually evaluate for the auditory processing because, for example, in the case of attention, information's not staying in the brain long enough to process. So it impacts all of the testing. It's not a good result. So if any of our clients come in and they don't pass the attention screening, we stop there. We wait until the attention is taken care of, and then we try again. Yeah. How often do you think you see um, someone coming in saying, I think it's auditory processing, or I think it's you know one of these things that are less common, like misophonia, and then you actually identify a hearing loss? Is that something that happens often? Not often. Um, I see that a lot for people that have tinnitus. They're just saying, I can hear fine. I just have ringing in the ear. So I see that a lot with tinnitus. I have had some individuals come in for auditory processing testing, and we found cookie bite hearing losses. So they didn't, and they had passed their screening in school, which I, I found kind of unbelievable. We ended up fitting hearing aids and went from there. Their reading level shot up multiple grade levels because they could hear. You know, that's it's important to be very methodical. And maybe that's part of what I like about auditory processing. It's that it is very methodical and you have to look at all of these different areas, but then it's like a puzzle because you have to take into account things like their attention. You have to look at their cognitive testing. You have to look at the psychoeducational information. You have to take information from the parents and the teachers and what's going on in the classroom and what's going on day-to-day -day life and come up with recommendations and a treatment plan that really suits the individual. It's not the same thing every day. I know a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, if it's this test battery, you just do it over and over again. And there's this written list of recommendations and it's not that at all. And it shouldn't be that. Absolutely. You have so much um, scoring and different tests that you do depending on, I mean, is it, from what I remember, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, typically, I mean, a child will come into the office. They'll be here at least 90 minutes. I'll talk to the parent either ahead of time or, you know, at least another 30 minutes, sometimes more. I go through their records and all their information, which I can get charts that are, you know, an inch thick of information. It takes at least 90 minutes to go through and write the report, at least, and then it's another hour going over in a conference with the parents or with their teachers or whoever they want to get that information, that feedback afterwards. So it's it's a lot of time to do auditory processing, but it's, it's a labor of love. And that would explain um, the cost structure where people are very concerned and surprised with how expensive it might be to get that kind of testing yeah, it's, it's interesting. I actually have that information on my website, very laid out. These are the CPT codes that we use. These are the pricing 
associated with each CPT code. This is why it's expensive because you're not just paying for that 90 minutes in the office. But if you look at other professionals, if we look at some of the neuropsychologists, the psychologists doing testing, it can be $1,000, $1,500 for psychological evaluation. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that we are priced out of the ballpark. I think that people are just not used to thinking about how much work and effort goes into some of these tests that they don't see. Yeah. And I think especially now people are taking a look at healthcare and healthcare delivery in general as something that needs to be looked at. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and it is really hard too, because things to remember about auditory processing, auditory processing disorder is diagnosed by audiologists. We are the professionals that have the proper equipment. We have the proper training. It's our scope of practice. There, in our community, we actually have speech language pathologists and some psychologists saying that, oh, you know, we test for that too. And they can't diagnose. So it's very difficult when I have a patient that comes in and they've seen another professional and they think they have a diagnosis, but they don't. Yeah. And that impacts their service delivery in the schools. So making sure that the correct professional is actually diagnosing is really important too. Absolutely. And I think my favorite thing of what you said in the beginning was about telling the child what's happening. And I think that's like part of my whole thing all the time is, are you honest with children about what's happening? <laughs> because they know, they can understand, you know, feel it. Yeah. And they know what they have a hard time with. And I think sometimes explaining to them, especially as they're a little bit older, I actually like to have them in that session where we go over everything in that yeah. parent session because they need to know what are things that they can do? How can they advocate for themselves? How can they position themselves to get information? They, they need to know where the breakdown is and what they can do. So a lot of it is talking about them and what their responsibility is. You know, it's the teacher's responsibility to provide the information. It's your responsibility to bring it home. It's your responsibility to give the FM to your teacher. It's your responsibility, you know, and, and giving them that, that ability. When we talk about children with organization disorder and we come up with different strategies, a lot of times the strategy, we want them involved. We want them going to Staples and picking out what post-it notes they want, what color notebooks and how do they want to organize their area and what are the things that they like. Mm -hmm. So making them a part of it's it's very important. That's so beautiful. Having the child with you in the room when you explain to them, what are the areas that, that we're striking to say, hey, this is actually something that when we did the testing, this was ex especially hard for you. And then having that validation that it's not just them making it up. You know, it's not just them being not good at something or unable to focus. And it's like, this is actually something of how your ears are processing, how your brain is processing. So what comes to mind for me is the speech and noise testing. And to know that you can have two children take the exact same test with, and they have the same hearing levels and they have, you know, everything else being equal, but one will really struggle when there's other sounds that just that filtering, picking out what they want to hear versus the noise will just be so, so challenging for their system whereas another child will be able to filter that out just fine, you know? Yeah. So they like that. They like knowing how, what does that mean in real life? Mm -hmm. So when you're in the cafeteria and you can't hear your friends, this is why, you know, making it very real life. Or, you know, if you're sitting in your, your tables and the teacher's talking behind you and this person's talking, it's harder. Or, when the teacher is talking with their back turned to you, or when somebody says this, you heard this. Right. And that's why sometimes you get those funny looks, <laughs> you know, but it's not the man mailed an otter, the man mailed a letter. So some of those, and, and then they, you know, sometimes get the giggles when they hear what it really was and what, what they thought it was, but also explaining that, by the end of the day, 
that's why you're tired. You're working so, so hard and talking about compensation mechanisms that they have because they're smart. So they figured out how to compensate. Quick responses, trying to rush and fill in is a compensation mechanism for shorter auditory memory. So it's like, wow, you're so smart that you figured out that you have a hard time remembering. So this is what you've been doing, but it doesn't help you because then you miss this part. So what do you think we could do instead? And then we bring up, you know, jotting a note or you know, other techniques or, or strategies. So it, it's very cool to do it yeah. that way. And the fact that in the session, the parent is also there, I think, I mean, obviously they need to hear the results, but for them to know, oh, for my child, you know, specifically, they're having trouble with remembering a couple of multi-step directions so they can change the way that they give directions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. you know, or even something as simple as, you know, for someone with a decoding deficit, repeating what you said instead of rephrasing, because with decoding, you're missing bits and pieces. So if you repeat, you're giving your child a chance to fill in those blanks. If you rephrase, you're giving them a whole new set of information and new blanks. It's something really simple, but it's easy. Yeah, and that, that's so counterintuitive because that's exactly the opposite recommendation for someone with hearing loss because they're going to keep missing the same sounds over and over. Yeah. So try a different word. Instead of saying, I went to the beach, say, I went to the boardwalk because maybe they're missing the ch at the end of beach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think yeah. it, as parents and educators, we're all about teaching and communicating and knowing the best way that we can communicate is really good too. And sometimes a parent will get a giant report because I'm sure the reports you write are seven to 12 more pages long. <laughs> of course, of course. So what I started doing with my reports, that, that's the way, you know, when I started my practice, it was all about all of the data and all of the information and very technical. And reports are only as good as the person can understand. So... I changed my report writing a lot over the years. And my first page, clinical impressions. That is the first thing that you see. What is it and what does it mean? Yes, they have auditory processing. No, they don't. And how is it impacting them? So then all the data, all the technical stuff, and then the recommendations. And the recommendations, you know what? No one needs 20 recommendations. They really don't. It's overwhelming. There's only so many hours in the day. There's only so many things that you can do. So prioritizing and what are the most important things to do now? And then we can look at some other things later. Oh, I love that. Doing like a prioritized immediate recommendations and then for the future, consider. Yeah. 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 Because if I can, for example, get a school to do three things, that's Awesome. That's amazing. And the school doesn't necessarily need that whole big report. They might do better with a one page letter that says, you know, this child has auditory processing disorder. It doesn't impact their intelligence, but for them to be, you know, be able to get the information that they need, here are some strategies that are necessary and three or four things. Uh, I wanted to ask you about if maybe you could tell us a story like a whole patient journey that can make it clear, you know, some, some like real, real gem <laughs> case study that's like on your mind, you know, that one kid. <laughs> so I can tell you about a really cool kid I had with misophonia. She was 15 or 16 to the point where she was being homeschooled because she couldn't really function in a classroom. She would go in for one or two classes and then she would come home. Um, active in dance, wanted to go out and do things, just could not handle the chewing sounds. So there were certain classes that she could work in, other classes where they allowed people to eat, couldn't function. So it impacted her social life, it impacted her family life. Yeah, so it was really very interesting because the more we sat and talked, the thing that came out that she really, really loved were Marvel movies, Marvel Avengers, and she hadn't been able to see any of them in the theaters. That's what she wanted to do, but she was afraid to go in because of 
the crunching and chewing of people with eating popcorn and candy in the movie theater. So what we ended up doing is we ended up using noise generators to help change that sensory contrast between her trigger sounds and her. So she wanted to watch Marvel movies. Yeah, she wanted to watch Marvel movies. We started, we used that as our positive sound. We ended up working with her so that we would desensitize her to the sounds that bothered her the most while using a pleasant stimuli. So while she was watching Marvel movies, we used an app and recorded sounds and we started desensitizing her to the trigger sounds. And using that, using the white noise generators, she was able to start going back to class. She was able to go to the movies. She was able to become much more a part of her family life. And, you know, there still were some trigger sounds that were annoying, but they weren't the ones that she was with every single day. So much more manageable. Um, she became a really big advocate in her circle for misophonia. The last time she came to visit, she had a big T-shirt that she had made with misophonia and facts on the back about it. And, you know, putting out all sorts of information. She had a project for a class. She did a video on misophonia. You know, she became very involved. The thing of it was that she was going back to class. She was being with her friends. She was being able to eat lunch with them. She was able to, you know, do the things that she wanted to do. And the coolest part, the reason I think it's very cool is that there's not too many times where you say, oh, I prescribed Marvel movies, but (laughs) we're we're treating with superheroes. I think that's just cool. Yes. I think we, I think uh, we don't get that as much as our SLP colleagues that really know all their yeah. favorite <laughs> Peppa Pig is a big one. Where When I was working at the school, there was one kid. She was just Peppa Pig all day, every day. So they had stickers and they had a plush pillow and they had all these cute things. <laughs> yeah. It's all about what motivates each individual client yeah. and each individual patient, because if it doesn't mean anything to them, why are they going to work for it? It has to be, you know, what do you want to do? What is this keeping you from doing? much in the way that we talk to our hearing aid patients too. Yeah. Do we have any ideas about where it comes from? What is the the cause or the onset of these sensitivities? For misophonia, we don't have a whole lot of information. We know that about 20% of the general population has some form of misophonia. Most people can tolerate it and it doesn't interfere with their day-to-day living. But there is that percentage for some reason or another. It tends to be more prevalent in females. It tends to start anywhere from like 9 to 12 years of age. For some reason, that limbic system catches a particular sound and it attaches to it. We don't know why. Well, I'm sure glad that people will know, you know, and get educated on the fact that they're not alone and they're not crazy. <laughs> they're not just hearing sounds that are bothering them like, how come everybody else is okay and not me? It's like, well, maybe you have to find your people. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Who know what you're going through. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of really good information online now. Yeah. It tends to be, you tend to be able to find your community and find resources, which is great. Mm-hmm. There's a very popular um, business coach that I, that I follow and learn from, Jenny Shi, And she writes about how she, part of why she started her business was because she really wanted to work from home. That was something that was really important to her. And while other people say, oh, they wanted, you know, to be entrepreneurs for whatever reasons to, you know, they had a specific message. They wanted to work from home just for the convenience or for making money or whatever. She said, this was like a medical situation for me. I had to make this work so that I could be in that kind of circumstance. I think that's fascinating. Any last advice or um, message for our listeners? Don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to reach out, find a practitioner that knows what they're doing. I I think I gave you the APD map of practitioners that work with auditory processing disorders. I gave you the Jasterbach website for TRTA, his two-minister training therapy, because that's one way that we treat misophonia is with TRT. So there's a whole list of providers that people can find near them that know what these conditions are and they know how to work with them and they should be able to get help all across the country. Yeah, we'll definitely link those in the show notes and at allaboutaudiology.com. And we also have a full episode all about tinnitus 
with Dr. Kelly Dyson. So if you're, if you want to learn more about that, then you'll Fantastic. link that as well. And if anybody wants to reach out to you or, or find you, where can they find you? Uh, they can find me through my website, which is audiologycharlotte.com. You can contact me directly through there. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Stay well. All good. Thank Thanks you so much. I'll be in touch. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the All About Audiology podcast. And thank you to Dr. Melissa Karp for sharing her expertise and her tips all about auditory processing and sound sensitivity. I am so grateful that you are a listener to the show and I cannot wait to hear your thoughts, your comments, your questions, your reactions. My favorite thing is when you screenshot when you're listening to the episode and then tag it on Instagram at All About Audiology Podcast and that makes me so, so happy and so grateful to have such wonderful listeners from around the world. Remember that to stay up to date on everything that's going on, in the All About Audiology world or to find out about ways to work with me, just visit the website allaboutaudiology.com and I, and I look forward to being a part of your journey. I'm Dr. Lilach Saperstein and this is the All About Audiology podcast.